And we pray that we would see your word for what it is, uh, that we would appreciate and prize and value it. Most of all, O oh God, we pray that we would not neglect your word personally, but make it our uh, eager ambition to run to you in your word, to meet with you, to hear from you, uh, that our lives might be what they ought to be uh, under it. And we ask for your help this morning as we think about representing you and your words. We pray to do so well. Uh, we pray to be faithful in that. Uh, fearful of misrepresenting you, but bold and courageous in speaking your truth. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I did just pray what is my heartbeat for this series. My desire is that we would be fearful of misrepresenting God as we speak for him. And we would, we would be bold and courageous in speaking on God's behalf. We are here on the earth as ambassadors. Uh, we represent truth. We know the truth. Uh, we must not be silent. And yet we ought to be very careful about how we represent God. So again, two themes as we walk through the series. Be very afraid to speak for God. Be very bold and courageous to speak for God. That's where we're headed. And at the risk of beating a dead horse on the front end of this, we will be this morning again on the side of cultivating a healthy fear of misrepresenting God. I would like to whet our appetites for next weekend, the women's conference. Uh, Cheryl Marshall will be speaking, and she'll be speaking the theme from the book uh, that she has written, When Words Matter Most, Speaking Truth with Grace to Those You Love. So I have heard that there is uh, still the availability to sign up for the Women's Conference even today. Is that accurate? Are we close? I think so. I think you can still sign up for it. So if you're hearing this promo uh, and you are a woman, uh, you can sign up for the Women's Conference um, where the, the sort of the second part of this series will be pressed, uh, which is we need to speak God's words and God's truth to one another. I have a picture for you. Uh, it'll be up here on the screen. Mike Lee shared this with me. He's traveling. Uh, I got permission from Mike to share this photograph. I did not get permission from the church on which this banner hangs in Boston to share this photograph. But they have hung this banner publicly, so it is evidently for public consumption. I didn't feel the need to reach out and ask for permission. Here's what the banner says, hanging on the outside of this church building. The top line, it's probably a little dim and hard to read on the small picture up there. It says, and God said, dot, 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 protect abortion access for all, ensure black lives matter, honor bodily autonomy, Defend LGBTQ plus rights. End voter suppression. Turn guns into plows. Abandon fossil fuels. Provide sanctuary. Abolish prisons. Disarm hate. Speak truth. Breathe. In other words, dot, 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 love. So th these are not unfamiliar slogans. Th these are things we hear in our culture. But this is on the outside of the church with the heading, God said. Now, this is, of course, brazen, audacious. And as we've been looking at, at God's words in the prophets, it will not end well for those who speak for God errantly. You're going to take up the charge and say, this is what God says, and fill in the blank with erroneous ideas, even with things that God hates, it will not end well. So we're going to continue working through uh, some of these prophets and what they have to say about speaking for God. Uh, let's continue our look and invite you to turn this morning to Jeremiah 14. Jeremiah 14, verses 13 through 16, says this. But ah, Lord Yahweh, I said, look, the prophets are telling them, you will not see the sword, nor will you have famine, but I will give you lasting peace in this place. Then Yahweh said to me, the prophets are prophesying falsehood in my name. 
I have neither sent them nor commanded them nor spoken to them. They are prophesying to you a false vision, divination, futility, and the deception of their own minds. Therefore, thus says Yahweh concerning the prophets who are prophesying in my name, although it was not I who sent them, yet they keep saying, there will be no sword or famine in this land. By sword and famine, those prophets shall meet their end. The people also to whom they are prophesying will be thrown out into the streets of Jerusalem because of the famine and the sword, and there will be no one to bury them, neither them nor their wives nor their sons or daughters, for I will pour out their own wickedness on them. This is a striking message. We heard Bobby Casillas walk us through the prophet Jeremiah last Sunday night, and tonight when we return for the book of Lamentations, we will see its fulfillment. These very things that Jeremiah prophesied will come true, or did come true, in Jeremiah's lifetime in the city of Jerusalem. Uh, the, those who claimed to speak for God were actually killed with a sword, the priests and the prophets. And those who listened to them suffered. Some survived, some were exiled, but many died of famine in the siege, and many died as they tried to escape, ambushed by the Babylonian armies. And we see the ways that uh, this warning uh, was, was fulfilled in Jeremiah's report in the book of Lamentations. What we need to understand here is that false prophecy was at odds in Jeremiah's day with true prophecy. Uh, the false message often wins the day. You, you remember from Bobby's description of Jeremiah last year, Jeremiah preached for 40 years before the siege and some 10 years afterwards to a people who would not listen. It was one lone foreigner, Ebed-Melech, the, the Ethiopian who rescued Jeremiah out of the pit, it seemed to be the only one who listened to his message. What was the popular message of the day? It was the message of the false prophets. Listen, this is very deceiving. We, we need to have a confidence in God's written word, even if the whole world is saying the contrary. That was true in Jeremiah's day. The false message won the day. Forty years proclaiming the truth, nearly nobody listened. Jeremiah was alone against the crowds, against the false messages. Notice in verse 13 that the false message was a happy message. You'll not see sword, nor will you have famine. I'll give you lasting peace as the Babylonian armies are encroaching on the city. <laughs> and in their very day, this prophecy fell apart. And it was a false message, according to verse 14. It was an unsanctioned message. God said, I did not send them. It was a deceptive message leading to futility, verse 14. And it would be proven to be false too late for its speakers and its hearers. In other words, it would have been nice for the people listening to false messages to say, that's not true, you don't represent the Lord, that doesn't go along with what God has already revealed. They should have dismantled it and disowned that message when it was being spoken. You remember the prescription from Mosaic Law. What were they supposed to do with a false prophet? Take him outside the city walls and throw rocks at him until he stopped breathing. It was the death penalty by stoning for false prophets. They should have done that. And you understand the, the demographic. The, the people wanted an easy message to listen to. They didn't want a message like Jeremiah's that would indict them for their sins of idolatry, immorality, uh, rejecting the Lord and embracing pagan uh, worship. They, they wanted an easy message. Jeremiah gave them a hard message, the truth. The false prophets gave them an easy message, and, and only when it was too late did the people understand that it was a false message. Disastrous consequences came for the people in verse 15 and 16, both for those speaking and for those listening. Turn to Jeremiah 23, and we'll spend a bit of time here in this chapter. We won't read the whole thing, but we'll hop, skip, and jump through it on this topic of false prophecy. We'll begin in verse 17. They keep saying to those who despise me, Yahweh has said, you'll have peace. And as for everyone who walks in the stubbornness of his own heart, they say, calamity won't come upon you. 
But who has stood in the counsel of Yahweh that he should see and hear his word? Who has given heed to his word and listened? Behold, the storm of Yahweh has gone forth in wrath, even a whirling tempest. It will swirl down on the head of the wicked. The anger of Yahweh will not turn back until he has performed and carried out the purposes of his heart. In the last days you will clearly understand it. I did not send these prophets, but they ran. I did not speak to them, but they prophesied. If they had stood in my counsel, then they would have announced my words to my people and would have turned them back from their evil way and from the evil of their deeds. I want you to notice, first of all, that the false message was not immediately silenced by God. And God has his purposes in this. Sometimes false messengers coming to a populace is itself a judgment of the Lord for unfaithfulness. The theologians refer to judicial hardening. Right, Phil Kagey sang about it. He said, give me more darkness, said the blind man. Give me more folly, said the fool. Give me stone silence, cried the deaf man. I didn't believe Sunday school. Right? If you can get what you're asking for, God may give it to you as a judgment. There's a real sense in God's purposes for sending delusions and false messages and allowing false prophets over time for a population that has rejected him is to give them more darkness when they're asking for it. And so this false prophecy is not immediately silenced by God. Notice in verse 17, they keep saying... They, they go on proclaiming this false message. That is, there is delayed punishment. And what do we do with delayed punishment? Ecclesiastes 8 says, the, son, the hearts of the sons of men are given more fully to do evil because the sentence is not executed quickly. We take God's mercy and leniency and long-suffering and patience as license. Do you know this about your own heart? You get away with something, there's not an immediate consequence to some wrong action, there's not an immediate reprimand for a bad attitude, and you just sort of simmer in it, you stay in it. What should we do when God is merciful and patient and long-suffering? Oh, God's kindness leads us to repentance. We ought to jump to setting our course straight when we recognize God has not given me, given me according to what I deserve. But what does the flesh do? What does a sinful heart do? What does a, a person completely given over to rebellion do? Huh, I, I guess I can keep doing what I'm going to do. I guess there's no consequence. No immediate consequence does not equal no consequence. In fact, again, tonight we'll see that in the book of Lamentations. The suffering that is experienced in Jeremiah's recording in Lamentations was the result of centuries of sin and rebellion and failure to repent at a national level. The judgments, that, the judgments that are coming on this whole world on a global scale are the result of 6,000 years up to this point of mankind's rebellion against his maker. Do not assume because the judgment has not come down yet that the judgment isn't coming. God's delay is a mercy, longing for people to repent, not a license. And notice the heart condition in verse 17 was very clear. They walked in the stubbornness of their own heart. That is, that they had a heart problem, and the happy message of the false prophets missed the rebellious heart. Why? Because the false prophets themselves were rebellious. They didn't want to proclaim a message that was indicting to themselves. And verse 18 makes it clear that they did not hear from God. They didn't receive new revelation. They did not heed what God actually said. They, they rejected what God said. They made it up for themselves. And we talked about the sources of false teaching last time. Sometimes it's someone who is sincerely misguided. Big heart, we might say a good heart. Uh, we sort of wink, wink. We know that there is no intrinsic goodness in man, but we think, oh, that guy's a good guy. He means well. And they're just misguided. They themselves are deceived, but the result of them broadcasting their deception is consequences for others. Others are more malicious. They know that they're deceiving. They are bent on a lie, and they want people to follow them, either for their own prestige or power or money or whatever other nefarious reason. But others are supernaturally deceived. False doctrines, according to Paul in 1 Timothy, are the doctrines of demons. There is a supernatural element behind these things. 
Satan is a liar. He parades as an angel of light. He masquerades the, the lies in the coverings, the whitewashing of some semblance of truth and that which is attractive because he's, as the, as the God of this world, seeking to bury the gospel and blind the minds of unbelievers so they will not believe it. So for whatever motivated these false teachers, they themselves were deceived. They weren't speaking God's words. And as a result, verse 19, they provoked God's anger. The storm of Yahweh. Judgment's coming, even if it is not immediate. That storm is brewing. And they will see God's true message, verse 20, the purposes of his heart. And notice what he says, in the last days you will clearly understand it. Listen, when the truth reigns, there will be no mistaking. All the scales will come off. All the deceptions will be exposed. All the frauds and deceivers will be seen for what they always were. And it will be too late for those who heeded their message. They weren't sent by God, verse 21. They completely misrepresented God, verse 22. Look down at verse 25 and 26. Jeremiah goes on, he says, I have heard what the prophets have said who prophesy falsely in my name, saying, I had a dream, I had a dream. How long is there anything in the hearts of the prophets who prophesy falsehood, even these prophets of the deception of their own heart who intend to make my people forget my name? Listen, they make bold claims, verse 25. They say, I had a dream, I had a dream. What's very captivating about that, for for a false teacher who claims some sort of direct line of revelation from God, some sort of inside track, it sort of levels everybody else out. You're below me because you didn't have the dream. I had the dream. I've got this corner on the truth. God is talking to me. It it elevates self and it puts everybody else down and, and now you have to listen to me. Whatever comes out of my mouth, it's like you may as well staple it to the back of your Bible, call it Revelation 23, add a chapter, and now you're bound by it. You see, if God has spoken, God's people listen and they heed. It then automatically becomes a matter of obedience and disobedience. And so the false prophet who's wielding revelation recklessly, carelessly, out of the deceptions of his own mind out of his own imagination is wielding power to cause God's people to obey him, the human voice. This is why it is so dangerous. It plays on the consciences of the righteous, of those who are in a right relationship to God. Listen, God speaks, I wanna follow. And so the false prophet understanding that power wields it for his own benefit. This bold claim, I have a dream, I have a dream, puts everybody on the outside and the false prophet on the inside. And he attaches God's name to it. This inside information, this dream, is a matter of personal experience. And the thing about your experience is who can deny it? It's yours. It happened to you. You, you, you saw what you saw, you felt what you felt, the, the circumstances were your circumstances, nobody is like you, nobody could be exactly in your shoes and feel all the things that you felt. Who could argue against your experience? And if your experience is tied to divine authority, it's exclusive. It belongs to you and it's inarguable. That's power. It's power in the hand of one with a false message. And notice God's exasperation. I don't mean like God's helpless, wringing his hands. What could I do about this? But notice verse 26. How long? Do you hear God's heart in this? How long are these prophets going to do this? How long will churches in Boston hang that banner and say, God said abortion for everybody? (laughs) How long is God going to let that go? How long will he tolerate people misspeaking in his name? Don't wear out God's mercy. And again in verse 26, this is a deception of their own hearts. They are self-deceived deceivers. Look down at verse 30. We'll read 30 to 32. Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, declares Yahweh, who steal my words from each other. Behold, I am against the prophets, declares Yahweh, who use their tongues and declare 
the Lord declares. Behold, I am against those who have prophesied false dreams, declares Yahweh, and related them and led my people astray by their falsehoods and reckless boasting. Yet I did not send them or command them, nor do they furnish this people the slightest benefit, declares Yahweh. Listen, fundamentally, their message is antagonism with God. While they are saying, I have a word from the Lord for you, God's actually against them. And he says it again and again and again in this passage. Far from being his mouthpiece, they have made God their enemy while invoking his name for their deception. That's scary stuff. The words are their own, verse 31. The dreams are false, verse 32. The consequences are serious. They involve people. They related those false dreams. The people were led astray, verse 32. These false teachers become what Jesus referred to as stumbling blocks, scandals, that which people trip over and end up in ruin. And do you remember what Jesus said about scandals, about stumbling blocks? They must come. They, They will be in the world. But woe to them by whom they come. It would be better for them to have a great millstone tied around their neck and cast into the depths of the sea than for them to be stumbling blocks in this way. Now, I've never had a millstone hung around my neck, nor have I ever been cast into the depths of the sea not to return. What is that a picture of? The, 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 in the ancient Near Eastern mind, the worst possible way to go out of life would be better than what comes next. In other words, there's no annihilation. Those who have crossed their maker will meet him personally and face an eternal destruction that never takes you out of existence. An ongoing ruin that brings you to utter devastation while you keep on existing forever and ever. Absolutely awful. The stakes are high for those who would be such deceivers and the stakes are high for those who would listen to them. God cares about his people. He says they are reckless, verse 32, proud, verse 32, again, not sent by God, and in verse 32, they are zero help. It's really an amazing thing. The the world loves its gurus, its TED Talks, its influencers, uh, everybody that has an opinion about something. Listen, there's lots of important things to share. I like getting other people's recipes that are better than my own, right? I I depend on YouTube for truck repair. Um, There's expertise to be had. But when someone rises to the level of, I'm going to tell you how life ought to be lived, what life is all about, how you get to heaven, what is true about God, what's true about you? And then they invoke God's name, God's authority, eternal truths for their opinions. This is dangerous ground. This is the the threshold of stumbling blocks. Look at Jeremiah 23, verse 36. For you will no longer remember the oracle of Yahweh, because every man's own word will become the oracle, and you have perverted the words of the living God, Yahweh of armies, our God. This is a fascinating verse. With the presence of lots of people speaking for the Lord, I have a word from the Lord, I have a dream, I have an intuition, here's a sign, there's a sign. It drowns out the true oracles. When everybody's got an oracle, nobody's got the oracles. This is the pragmatic effect of of everybody believing that God is speaking to them. It drowns out where God has actually spoken. This isn't even the, hey, the Bible's not true. This is just, yeah, Bible, sure, and all these other things. And eventually nobody's reading the Bible. It's dilution. It completely drowns out God's voice by claiming to know God's voice. In addition to dilution, the effect of this is inoculation. We talked about this a little bit last week. People come along and say, I'm speaking for God. Here's what God thinks. Here's what God says. Here's a representation of his worldview. And people who have never opened their Bibles get a sense that they know what God is all about. And they don't. They they are now inoculated. Oh, I don't need to read the Bible. I know what's in it. Have you heard people say that? Share the gospel with people on the street. Have you ever read the Bible? Oh, no, no, I know what's in it. 
that's not what I asked. <laughs> Have you ever read the Bible for yourself? Well, no, I got a pretty good idea. Where do they get the pretty good idea of what's in it? The representations in our culture, in our society, often misrepresentations. It drowns out God's word. Inevitably, we develop an appetite for substitutes and we lose discernment for the real thing. <clears throat> Can I step on toes this morning? You might be thinking, you've stepped on every toe in the room already. Okay, one more. I want to step on, do I want to? I don't know. I'm debating, I'm having this internal debate in my mind. Can I step on our Christian entertainment toes for just a little bit? Okay, Suzanne Blevins says I can. She gave me permission, so I will. I'm not a big fan of fictionalized renderings of biblical narratives. And, and here's why. I don't want to utter, overstate a preference here, but I have concern when script writers and producers add and subtract from what people perceive to be God's word. Okay, I'm, I'm trying to say that very carefully. <laughs> when something is presented in, for an entertainment value or informational value from the world of entertainment and, and people perceive that is the Bible, that is the biblical story, that is the biblical narrative, but it has in it the, the elements of the genre of historical fiction. You know, conversations are filled in. Settings are filled in. Um, all kinds of things are filled in. Motives. The, things that aren't in the biblical text, they, they, they sort of have to be added for the screenplay value of an entertainment product. I think there is real danger here. There is subtraction, there is addition, and I think these things lend themselves to misrepresentation. I'll give you a couple examples that are on my mind. You can apply this uh, in ways that are appropriate to your own preferences, I suppose. But I think about Hollywood movies. Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion of the Christ. Um, I saw it. It was moving. It had effects on me related to the physical suffering of a man crucified. And if you saw it, you know what I mean by that. It was stunning, staggering, visually provocative, humbling. I wept. And yet, if you know anything about Mel Gibson and the production of that movie, it was very heavily pre-Vatican II Catholic committed in its theology. And what it missed in its messaging, although it got the facts of a crucifixion right, pretty good, mostly, right? Um, the movie gave the fact that Jesus of Nazareth was crucified on a Roman cross in the first century. That's accurate. What the movie didn't tell us is why, which is the message of the Bible. That is a fundamentally flawed subtraction of a presentation about why Jesus came to the earth. It missed the gospel altogether. And, and actually, subtly, and if you knew what you were watching, conveyed an anti-gospel message in and through it. That's a problem. That's a misrepresentation. There are the animated retellings, and, and I'm just going to step on the veggie tail toes here for a second. I didn't know what veggie tails was. I showed up in Nashville, Tennessee as a youth pastor, and I'm preaching the Joseph narrative. And a, a junior higher says, hey, Mr. Smed, hey, is, is that when the cucumber said to the... <laughs> I, I literally had no categories for this question. And, and the story from the animated cucumber version actually was different than the biblical narrative on some point. And I said, no, that never happened. And they said, yes, it did. No, it didn't. Yes, it did. No, it did. But the cucumber, and I'm like, what is the cucumber? I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> and there was a greater familiarity with the animated retelling than with the biblical narrative. It's one thing to be familiar with the Joseph narrative and then watch an animated retelling and, and say, I see what they did there. Eh, off, on, whatever. But the problem is when it's presented as the biblical narrative, and people take it that way, it becomes the baseline of the truth of the narrative. It's a misrepresentation. 
Now I'll give you another example, the current television series, The Chosen. And, and I haven't seen it, I'm not planning to see it, uh, unless there is some uprising that requires discernment. Um, I know a lot of people are watching it. I, I've read a number of second-hand accounts. I, I don't wanna speak to The Chosen directly or particularly, except that it is in the genre of a representation of biblical narrative with screenplay additives and production subtractions. And so I just don't like it. You might like it, you might benefit from it. If it points you to truths of scripture, I would praise God for that effect. I would suggest, however, that your benefit from it will be directly related related to your familiarity with the truth, which does not err, which does not inject production ideas, and screenplay additives. In fact, nothing but the Word of God, Hebrews 4.12, is alive and active and sharper than a two-edged sword and able to discern the internal workings of the human heart. Nothing does that but the Word itself. Substitutions, replacements that try to help us get there, they don't actually own or possess the power that the Word of God itself does. So that's just a caution. I actually like historical fiction as a literary genre, but I have a low tolerance for filling in the storyline of the Bible with fictionalized details, character development, imagined context. Most people who watch them can't tell where the Word of God ends and where the man-made additions begin. Some people quickly assume they know what the Bible's about because they saw any one of those things. That's always interpretive. It's never inerrant. By the way, the the movie is easier. Do Do you know this about yourself? Reading's hard work. It's hard to learn how to read. I don't know if you remember learning how to read or if you are learning to read right now. It's tough. And the older you are, as you try to exercise growth in reading ability, the less pliable your brain is. It's just hard. And then the discipline of opening your Bible in the morning and sitting there and reading and closing out distractions. You don't have to work that way when you watch a movie. It just happens to you. It's absorption and it's surround sound and it just comes at you. It doesn't take the kind of work that reading does. And God did not give us a movie. He gave us a book. He he put his words onto pages, scrolls, parchments, so that they would forever stand as they are. That is, the meaning can never change. A verse in your Bible doesn't change its meaning. It doesn't come to mean something other than what it meant the first moment it was penned. Inscripturation means solidification. It doesn't go anywhere, it's not flexible. Visual arts, delightful, fun, engaging, helpful in some ways, but they don't interpret themselves. This is the problem, and I use the word problem loosely, with natural revelation. Right? Natural revelation is a biblical category. This is creation screaming out the glory of God, Psalm 19 and Romans 1. Men understand who God is, something of what he's like, that he exists, and that he created from all that has been made. His invisible power, divine attributes have been clearly seen from what has been made so that men are without excuse. Natural revelation is beautiful. I hope you scuba dive and you climb mountains. I hope you look through telescopes and microscopes and everything in between and you revel at God's creative genius. It all screams his glory. And yet Psalm 19 on natural revelation is interesting. It says, their line has gone out out to the earth and there are no words. What does that mean? I, I thought it was screaming. Yes, it's an inarticulate declaration of the glory of God. It doesn't come with its own interpretation. Any more than your own experience comes with its own interpretation. But the word of God, inscripturated, solid, unmoving, 
has power because it is from God, it is inerrant because God cannot lie, and it will never change, settled forever in heaven. Nothing like the Word of God. Remember, the movie's easier, but the movie doesn't scrutinize the heart. The Word of God does. It has power and authority in our lives, totally incomparable to other things in the universe. Now, you're going to ask me about C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia, R.C. Sproul's The Lightlings, or Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, or Shylin's Penelope Judd. You might call me a hypocrite. I would just say those are a different category. <laughs> Here, here's the nuance for me. Those are presented as fictional stories that intend to convey parallels to biblical themes and storylines. Um, if you're going to say, um, The Horse and His Boy is my favorite book. Okay, I like C.S. Lewis too. I like the Chronicles of Narnia. We've read them to our kids. We should never mistake those fictional things as if they tell the Bible's storyline. They have connection points and intentional parallels, but they're powerless. Um, they, they, they are fiction. They present themselves as fiction. I think that is a fundamental difference. All right, those are my thoughts. I'll remove my foot from our veggie tail toes and we'll move on. Here's the principle from Jeremiah 23, 36. When the words of mere men are presented as the oracles of God, and those words proliferate in the collective conscience of society, the true oracles of God are drowned out. That's the danger. All right, Jeremiah 23, down to verse 38. For if you say, the oracle of Yahweh... Surely thus says Yahweh, because you said this word, the oracle of Yahweh, I have also sent to you, saying, you shall not say the oracle of Yahweh. Therefore, behold, I will surely forget you and cast you away from my presence along with the city which I gave you and your fathers. I will put everlasting reproach on you and an everlasting humiliation which will not be forgotten." Listen, if you go on claiming to speak for God what he has not spoken, judgment is coming. And listen to this threat. The, the threats of God in the Bible while you're still alive is a mercy. If you're not dead, it's because there is time to repent. What a kindness of the Lord here. Even to those who have audaciously stepped in and claimed to speak for him. And then he says, if you do not, I will forget you. Um, God doesn't have amnesia, right? Um, there's a parallel here. He says, uh, you will depart from my presence. Th this is like, uh, you have to leave the garden in Genesis 3. Uh, depart from here and a cherubim with a flaming sword, you can't get back in. Or those terrifying lit words on the lips of Jesus when he would say to those who disobeyed the gospel, depart from me, I never knew you. He's not talking about whether God uh, remembers or forgets that these false prophets existed. In fact, their destruction is not going to be forgotten. That's the irony here. He's talking about a relational knowledge. Depart from me, I don't know you is. You don't belong to me. I am not your father. You're not my children. Go away. Terrifying words. Not only the city, and that again will be fulfilled um, would be fulfilled as recorded in the book of Lamentations. Uh, but then also everlasting condemnation, which ironically God says will not be forgotten. <laughs> I'll forget you and I will remember what you've done and you'll head to destruction which will not be forgotten. Look at Jeremiah 29, verses 8 and 9. For thus says Yahweh of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets who are in your midst and your diviners deceive you, and do not listen to the dreams which they dream. For they prophesy falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares Yahweh. This is, uh, again, a command to the listeners. Don't give them an audience. They should have followed Mosaic law and given them the death penalty. And it's hard when, when the prophets, when the mouthpieces hold all the power, right? The, these false teachers were in league with the king and the judges of the land. What can you do? 
If the education systems and the judicial system and the executive branch are all in league together, what, what do you have, listener? Well, you, you walk with your feet. You, you refuse to listen, refuse to heed. You run to the law and to the testimony, as we looked at last week. You trust God and His true words. Look at Jeremiah 29, 21. Thus says Yahweh of armies, the God of Israel, concerning Ahab, the son of Kaliah, and concerning Zedekiah of Maseah, who are prophesying to you falsely in my name. Behold, I will deliver them into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he will slay them before your eyes. I mispronounced that. I'm so sorry. With my vocal inflection, I led you to believe the quote was from the false prophets. It's not. It's to the false prophets from God. Let me try that again. I know I'm going fast. I'm going too fast for myself. Let's back up. Verse 21. Thus says Yahweh of hosts, the God of Israel, concerning Ahab, uh, Zedekiah, Maseah, they're prophesying falsely. Here's what God says to them. Behold. Is that better? Okay. I will deliver them into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he will slay them before your eyes. Because of them, a curse will be used by all the exiles from Judah who are in Babylon, saying, May Yahweh make you like Zedekiah and like Ahab, whom the king of Babylon roasted in the fire, because they have acted foolishly in Israel and have committed adultery with their neighbor's wives. They have spoken words in my name falsely, which I did not command them, and I am he who knows, and I am a witness, declares Yahweh. This is heavy. God will be vindicated. You and I need to trust him, wait on him, believe his words, and then multiply your belief by time. That's what it means to wait on the Lord, to trust God over time, to keep on believing his words. Even if the whole world seems to be going after falsehood, you cling to his word. You yourself will be vindicated in the end. Look down at verse 23. They acted foolishly. They spoke in my name falsely. I did not command them. I am a witness. Listen, God knows everything. Their false message, according to verse 29, was connected to their own personal sin. There's usually a relationship there. When someone is harboring secret sin and they claim to be a mouthpiece for the Lord, the message gets garbled. They're not going to represent him accurately. Sometimes the misrepresenting God precedes the secret sin. Sometimes the secret sin precedes the garbled message, but they are related. It's a comfort to know that God knows. He knows the hearts. He's a witness. He sees all. He will vindicate. There's an extended story here beginning in verse 24. I think we can take a stab at this. To Shemaiah the Nehelamite, you shall speak. Thus says Yahweh of armies, the God of Israel, because you have sent letters to your, in your own name to all the people who are in Jerusalem, to Zephaniah, son of Messiah, the priest, and to all the priests, saying, <clears throat> the Lord has made you priest instead of Jehoiada the priest to be the overseer in the house of Yahweh over every madman who prophesies to put him in the stocks and in the iron collar. Now then, why have you not locked up Jeremiah? <laughs> For he sends us to Babylon, saying the exile will be long, build houses, live in them, plant gardens, and eat their produce. And then God tells Jeremiah what to say to those false prophets. So here's the story. Shemaiah wrote a letter to the priest named Zephaniah, and he misrepresented God. He said, you have to lock up Jeremiah the prophet because he's telling us to go to Babylon. That's unpatriotic. It undermines the, the powers of the king and, and, and it undermines the powers of, of the nobility in Jerusalem. It will weaken the resolve of the people to withstand a military invasion. Can you imagine the pressure Jeremiah was under? Encroaching armies, Jeremiah saying, trust the Lord. <laughs> trust the Lord and you'll live. You'll actually be blessed. Things will go well for you. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, Jeremiah 29, 11. That's Jeremiah's message. And they're saying he's unpatriotic, he's undermining morale, and he's a, he's a disaster. So lock him up. Jeremiah's message was wildly unpopular. He went against the grain of the judiciary, the executive arm, and the media. He went against every opinion poll of the population in the land. And yet Jeremiah spoke God's actual words. God gives comfort in verses 31 and 32. Essentially, God says, Shemaiah is a liar. He's the one in rebellion, not Jeremiah. And Shemaiah will not survive. 
And in addition to that, he will have no descendants. His entire family line will be wiped up in judgment from God for misrepresenting God, for invoking God's name to lie to deceive the people. A deception, by the way, which left the people in their moral filth and promised them blessings without repentance. It should have been transparent. Wait, Jeremiah is saying hard things that require faith and obedience and representing the Lord. And this other guy who claims to speak for the Lord said, continue to live in your moral filth and you don't have to change your life and all will go well. We should all see through that. And the city suffered. Shemaiah did not survive the siege of Jerusalem when the devastation came on Judah and all of this happened in Jeremiah's own lifetime. Shemaiah, for speaking falsely in God's name, would not be taken to Babylon, be treated well and cared for by God, to be brought back to the land after the 70 years. He died in judgment. And then God goes further and said, not just temporal judgment, but eternal judgment. Lamentations 2.14. Notice what God says. And, And this is looking back to Jeremiah's prophecies from the ash heap of Jerusalem Your prophets have seen for you false and foolish visions. They have not exposed your iniquity so as to restore you from captivity, but they have seen for you false and misleading oracles. Listen, God's word regularly brings conviction. One of the purposes of exposing yourself to God's word is exposing those areas that are not in keeping with godliness yet. And we're all students in that school. None of us are what we should be. We're not what we used to be, but none of us have arrived. We're all growing in grace. If your approach to God's word leaves your sin untouched, you're doing it wrong. Now, not every message from the Lord is a message of rebuke. Uh, There is comfort. 1 Thessalonians 5.14, we need to have discernment uh, when to admonish the unruly or encourage the faint-hearted or help the weak, and we have to be patient with everybody. Uh, We have to exercise discernment there. And God's word is multifaceted. It strengthens the weak. It comforts the faint-hearted. But over time, where there is sin in your life, if there is idolatry or there are priorities out of place, if there is worldliness or fleshly indulgence or temporal-mindedness or perspectives and attitudes in need of adjustment, if you do not experience the exposure of these things and the indictments that come from God's word, you're not reading God's word right. You're not exposing your heart to God's word the way he intends. I hope this isn't tedious. I I really, I want to get on to speaking positively for God and having courage to do that, but I think we need to be biblically settled in an appropriate fear of misrepresenting him. That will position us well to speak boldly for God. I'm going to skip a, a few more of these. There are many in the prophets. The bottom line on God's revelation is it is in keeping with his character. Titus 1-2, God cannot lie. His word cannot lie. So the metric for representing God is its 100% accurate truthfulness. That becomes critical for our applications of speaking on God's behalf. Errant revelation is no revelation. We dare not speak where God has not spoken. I beat up a song last week, and um, again, stepping on toes here. The, the, it's in the hymnal, it's in a lot of hymnals. I come to the garden alone. Uh, you may have grown up singing it, I did. I gave the song a little, little bit of a hard time last week. I did a little research this week, and, and I want to share with you what I discovered. Uh, here's the lyrics of the song. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses, and the voice I hear falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses. And he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own, and the joy we share as we tarry there, none none other has ever known. He speaks, and the sound of his voice is so sweet, the birds hush their singing, and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing. I'd stay in the garden with him, though the night around me be falling, but he bids me go through the voice of woe, his voice to me is calling. This text was written by C. Austin Miles in 1912, made it into a number of hymnals. His own account of the writing of this song was a reflection on John chapter 20 and Mary Magdalene's um, 
approach or, or when Jesus approached her in the garden. He, he's trying to put us in Mary Magdalene's shoes and imagine what it would have been like to actually hear Jesus' voice in the garden while the dew was on the roses and to want to tarry there. And then Jesus said, no, I, I gotta go. That's a, that's a totally different view of that song than I had growing up. I'm not s- suggesting that we sing it here. It is uh, liable to misunderstanding. I, I, I do have a different appreciation for it now, though um, we're not going to sing it. I do want to give a little bit of personal testimony to re- related to my own mysticism. Because I think it's possible to misspeak for the Lord out of a sincere heart. Meaning, I love the Lord. Um, I want others to, to love the Lord. And, and I feel like I have a relationship with him because I have these promptings and these thoughts and, and I see these signs and, and, I, and I have dreams and, and, I, and I grew up singing B.J. Thomas's version of In the Garden Alone on cassette tape over and over and over again. I just, I feel like God talks to me. And that feels like a relationship. By way of personal testimony, that, that's where I was. That, that's how I felt uh, about these things. And I was in a context where getting direct revelation was considered normal spiritual life. And, and it was combined with a, a lot of the charismatic expressions of, of miraculous things, so-called miraculous things. Again, I, I listened to that, that B.J. Thomas song in the garden over and over and over again. Maybe you listened to the Elvis Presley version of it. I don't know. I read Frank Peretti's spiritual warfare fiction novels. Anybody read Frank Peretti? Okay. Those affected me profoundly. <laughs> I, I was ready to see demons and angels everywhere and to interpret every spat of indigestion as a prompting from the Lord. It, it, I was very susceptible at the time. And, uh, and vulnerable to those things. The effect was I had a fairly developed worldview based on experience and feelings and signs and direct revelation. And, and I think what was good about that is it, it helped me to think that everything has a spiritual reality to that, which is true, as opposed to a base naturalism or, or an anti-supernatural view of the world. Of course everything is spiritual. Satan is the God of this world. There are angels, there are demons. The Holy Spirit is real, he works. God is sovereign over the meticulous details of everything in the universe. And if you boil down everything that happens to cause and effect at a base materialism, you are dead wrong in your worldview. So a spiritual view of things is right. But the bad side of it for me was the written word of God was sort of boring second place to the excitement of spiritual warfare, laying out fleeces, following mysterious signs, waiting and listening for a still small voice and some mysterious prompting from the Lord. And the effect for me was one of pride. I I held to a spiritual elitism that made others feel less spiritual if they didn't have these same experiences. And I leveraged my experiences over others. I had felt on the outside when, I had felt like I was on the outside when others leveraged their mystical experiences in my presence and I in turn made others feel on the outside when I had mine. And I had misdefined relationship. I assumed a relationship meant two-way conversation. I talk to God in prayer, he talks to me in promptings. Of course there is a relationship. We have a filial relationship, father-son, daughter-son relationship to God by adoption through the blood of Christ and the Holy Spirit dwells in us and even causes us subjectively to feel like God is our father. That's Romans 8. But, but I, had, I had taken that idea of a relationship and made it totally dependent on me hearing from God in direct revelation. That was a mistake. It produced a neglect of seeking God in his written word. And to my shame, this was overturned not by exegesis. Not by a, what does the Bible say about my experiences? My experience was overturned by an experience. I'll share it with you, not because it has power, just so that you know me a little bit. My freshman year in college, uh, we were told by the dean of students in a Bible college that uh, he, they had forgotten to tell us to run a campaign, put up posters, um, you know, get a following for freshman class officers. So in a, a chapel, 
he, he stood up and said, hey, today is freshman class elections. We didn't warn you. Uh, nominate some people around you. Come up here, give an impromptu speech, and we'll just vote right now. Of course, my buddies on the 14th floor of Colbertson Hall at the Moody Bible Institute uh, said, hey, you want to do this? Let's nominate each other. So a little circle of us all nominated each other, and we all won. It was great. We were the freshman class officers. Uh, our freshman class chaplain, um, who is uh, a, a friend and uh, who is a faithful pastor to this day, had been a believer about a week. <laughs> and we voted him as the chaplain. At any rate. <clears throat> Nate Archer gave up to give the speech for the vice presidential position. And ahead of him were four students who got up and said things like this. God is leading, to, leading me to be in leadership at the Moody Bible Institute. Um, God told me I should be the freshman class vice president. God's put it on my heart to be the vice president. Four in a row of these mystical, direct revelation, words from God that that is your candidate. But you can't have four vice presidents. None of us saw the irony except for Nate Archer. And Nate Archer got up to the podium and said, in the fourth hour of my devotions, a light appeared in the corner of my room and it got bigger and bigger and bigger and it was Moses. And Moses says, Nate Archer, I want you to run for freshman class vice president. And who am I to go against the word of Moses? What do I want, the 10 plagues of Egypt to fall in the Moody Bible Institute? And Dean, I almost said his name, the Dean of Students came over to the podium and pulled Nate away from the microphone whispered in his ear in front of all of us. Nate just smiled <laughs> and walked off stage. Of course, he won in a landslide. <laughs> this guy was a straight comedian. It devastated me. I said in that moment, oh, I can't talk like that. I had been talking like that. Bible college felt like summer camp all the time, and we were all on a spiritual high. God told me this, God let me that. We were all doing that. And all of a sudden, it gripped me. Nate got busted for putting words in Moses' mouth, and the dean of students was totally offended by it. Nobody in the room was offended when, when all those other guys put words in God's mouth. Oh, it just took the bottom out from my mysticism. And, and again, to my shame, what should have fixed my mysticism? The Bible. What should, have ex what should have changed my view of my experiences shaping my theology? The Bible. And God providentially used an experience to undo my experientialism. We'll talk about some of the ways this is done. L listen to Isaiah 8. Should not a people consult their God to the law and to the testimony, says the prophet. And listen to the law of God, the word of God. Psalm 19, verse 7. The law of Yahweh is perfect. Restoring the soul. The testimony of Yahweh is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of Yahweh are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of Yahweh is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of Yahweh is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of Yahweh are true. They are righteous altogether. More desirable than gold, yes, than much fine gold. Sweeter than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned. In keeping them is great reward. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. May we be ashamed of substitutes. And may we cling to your word, speak your word, herald your word faithfully as long as you give us breath in this life. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.